I'd like to say a happy Sabbath to all of you. Uh, this is quite an unusual time that we're in, and uh, this is a, um, an unusual cir circumstance for me. This is a pre-recorded uh, message that, uh, that, that I'm giving. And the reason that I'm doing this and the reason we're doing this now is because we're uh, wanting to follow uh, the government and state mandates of less than 10 and making sure that we are, you know, if we've got mandatory or voluntary, uh, you know, stay-at-home orders that we do that. And so we're doing, doing this pre-recorded message so that uh, all of us will have the opportunity to have a, a sermon on Sabbath as we're home since we have canceled uh, church services. And of course, that is what we've recommended. So very glad for the opportunity uh, to do that. I hope all of you are well. I hope all of you are staying, um, following directives and staying safe and away from uh, crowds and things that might uh, contribute to the furtherance of this as the goal is to, you know, get below the curve and to not have that spike in sick people. So uh, we're glad for the opportunity. Uh, we are experiencing right now what I would consider um, an unprecedented time. In my lifetime, I have never seen anything like this. Uh, I believe that our sound minds should direct us at this time and tell us rather, that, rather than to get into a panic uh, about what is going on, and what's being promulgated through the news and uh, everywhere that you want to turn, uh, you know, we got to follow the stock market, and then it's up and it's down, and or whatever the catastrophe is going to be with this, that that we instead uh, not get too overcome with that, and remember as we approach these days of unleavened bread and the Passover, that we focus on some important things. Uh, we can have peace, and we can be. Uh, assured that all will be well, that God will take care of us, and that we at this time then focus and reflect on the new beginning that we had at baptism as we began our journey towards the kingdom of God, and that we continue thinking about that and what we need to do to make sure that we finish our course because those are really the more important items and the more important things that we need to focus on and the things that we need to look at at this time. Uh, I encourage all of us in these uncertain times to keep our focus on spiritual matters, uh, spiritual things of importance um, of God's plan, because that is uh, certainly, uh, we, we recognize that before the kingdom can come, before uh, the new age that we're looking for can come, that this one has to wrap up and end. So. We just look forward to that taking place, and so let's focus on those things that bring us uh, closer to God, that bring us closer to our Father in Heaven, and that bring us, uh, remind us of the upcoming Passover season that we are about to enter. And my message today is going to be about that. Uh, it's going to be uh, about the subject of forgiving and learning how important that is. But before we get there, I would remind us, uh, you know, we're talking about the current events and the things that are going on and that we need to trust in God. I, I'd like to remind us of several powerful, comforting scriptures. Uh, I will, I'm going to give you three of them and I want to read the fourth one because, uh, the, you know, if we don't have the Word of God as our uh, force and what's in our heart and in our mind out of our mouths, then we could get, uh, could get distracted in a greater way than we need to at this time. I would remind us of what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Uh, please, let's do that. Let's trust in God. It says, Lean not to your own understanding. So I uh, fight the urge to want to come up with an analysis of what's going on. But it, I would be leaning to my own understanding. So we shouldn't do that. We should trust in God and, you know, acknowledge Him, acknowledge Him in all His ways, because He will direct our paths. And I believe that. I know God will protect us. He will be with us, and He will be uh, leading us. And we, you know, uh, I remind us that the children of Israel, when He was leading them out of captivity, they had to experience four plagues. Go back and read that while they were in the land of Goshen. So it's okay that we have to go through things. Let's not panic. Let's trust God and know that for a certainty, all that He has promised us will come to pass, and we will have the, 
that which He has promised us, which is the kingdom of God. Uh, I would encourage us to read Psalms 91 completely, the whole chapter that talks about, you know, though 10,000 fall on my right and 10,000 on my left, I will not fear because you are with me. Let's remember that. And I also encourage us to remember what is stated in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, which says, it is, uh, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So let's not, uh, let's not forget that. We are not to fear. Fear is the weapon of our enemy. But we have been given the spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. I did want to read this over in First Peter, First uh, Peter chapter two, just a few uh, before we jump into the subject of forgiveness. First Peter chapter two, uh, just a few verses here, and I just want to I want to read this because uh, some have the tendency to not want to follow protocols and things that are laid out and say that we don't have to. But I just remind us of these words. It says, beginning here in verse eleven, dearly beloved. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil of you uh, as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's show our good works during this time. Let's, let's show cooperation. Let's show patience. Let's not get unraveled. Let's not go predicting, you know, what we think is happening, but that we show and be, show our good works. It says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto the governor, as unto them that are sent by him by the punish, uh, for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with all well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So, and, and, you know, so this is the thing right, that I believe is during this time we have not been told we can't keep the Sabbath. We're just asked to not congregate. So therefore we're doing things like this, webcasts. Nothing wrong with that. We're not being forced to sin by not being together. So uh, let's, let's just uh, have patience because this will be over soon and, uh, and we will be uh, on our way back to the things that we need, need to be doing. So today as we're getting close to Passover, uh, I wanted to talk about the subject of forgiveness. Uh, this is uh, maybe not something that ha- would have to be given at Passover, but let me just say At this time, I believe this subject to be uh, paramount, uh, that we are able to do this, that we're able to learn to forgive. And the subject is forgiveness, but specifically, how do we move from holding of grudges to forgiving one another? And and I'm convinced that understanding the concept (laughs) of forgiveness is much easier than actually implementing it and doing it. Forgiveness is a conscientious choice that we make. It is a choice that we make. We choose to forgive. And is that important? Well, I think we'll see that it is very, 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 very important. This is what we're going to run into, though, as we go go through this subject. As you begin to think about forgiving, about holding of grudges, we're going to recognize uh, that it, with the scriptures that we're going to read, that it is incredibly important to our spiritual health that it is quite frankly important to our salvation that we learn to forgive one another. Uh, We're going to have to deal with our natural human nature as we begin thinking about this and as we begin implementing this, that wants to hold on to grudges. You know, hold on to grudges like it's my little baby. I want to hold on to my little baby. Oh, grudge, I love you, grudge. We have to get rid of that, and it's hard. But we have to think about that. And then we're going to have to deal with our proclivity to, of not wanting to forgive when we've been wronged. Just going to have to have to do that. So what I want to do here is let's look at what a grudge is. And then let's look at what forgiveness is. And then let's look at scriptures that verify and validify how important it is that we do this. So what is a grudge? What is a grudge? Well, it's a feeling of resentment, of ill will. 
Uh, it would include words, synonyms like bitterness, rancor, malevolence, uh, enmity, hatred, spite. That is, that is what uh, happens when we have a grudge. We're filled with that. Uh, it, the word grudge comes from a Middle English word, which means to grumble or complain, which actually comes from uh, a French word meaning to be grouchy. So I guess if we hold a grudge, we're grouchy at somebody for what they've done or what they've said. And that would certainly be the case, and that would certainly be true. Uh, you know, we have, we, have, we have to recognize that. And this is probably the most powerful of the definitions in my mind about what a grudge is. Uh, one of the dictionaries says that it is a resentment strong enough to justify retaliation. You know, sometimes people say things or do things to us, and we want to just rise up and, you know, give them a knuckle sandwich. Uh, in the Bible, grudge is, comes from the Hebrew word uh, N-A-T-A-R, if you want to look it up, 5201, which means to guard or cherish in anger, to keep it, to reserve it, you know, to keep that little baby, keep that little grudge going. Uh, and it's, uh, it's sad that we do that. It's sad that we have the, to think that we have to have that kind of uh, um, animosity towards others. And I, of course, strongly recommending that we don't do that, that we forgive and that we move on and that we forget those things. You probably heard this, I just love my job, but it's the people that make me miserable. And isn't it true that in our relationships with others, we realize that sometimes people are difficult to work with. And uh, I've been told that about me sometimes, that I'm difficult to work with. Well, I, you know, that doesn't make me feel good that I, that I am uh, been told that. So uh, that is something that I'm working on, not to be someone that's difficult to work with. Uh, sometimes... Uh, well, people will say things that make us just absolutely angry and mad. And, you know, what do we do about that? It can happen at work. It can happen at school. You know, you can have some of your friends, kids at school that say things that uh, are just horrible. Uh, somehow kids can do that. But, you know, hey, so can us adults. And it can happen at home. We can have those kind of grudges against one another, husbands and wives and brothers and sisters, and words can be said that, uh, that will cause animosities, and if we're not careful, would, would maybe hinder, uh, you know, our forgiving one another. But we have to be able to do this. Uh, I have seen this happen in church over the years, and it's a sad thing for me to say, but I have watched churches split over these kind of issues animosity, grudges, because people just could not get along with one another. And they refused to forgive one another. You know, sometimes things are said intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Other times things are said it's just a pure accident and we take it wrong. Words can hurt. And even though we have that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, ha, lie. They absolutely do. And we are capable of, capable of doing things and saying things without even thinking about it, which, you know, means we're not intentional usually. And sometimes people make mistakes, and, you know, we all do. We all make those uh, mistakes. And when we do that, how are we supposed to respond? Well, we're supposed to forgive. We're supposed to work with one another. We're going to see that in scriptures. Um, but regardless of the, of the reason and the circumstances, we will... Uh, we will sometimes find ourselves in a situation where we are hurt or offended and we put those circumstances where, we, where we're uh, so bad that we're in our, deep within our hearts that we forgive. We can, can't forgive. We begin to hold a grudge and that's not a good thing. I have a story that I want to relate to you. Uh, it's a very personal story, not just quite yet, but down the road. It, uh, it is about my mom and a story that uh, I want to relate to all of you. So where, you know, we, we're at church, we are looking into the Word of God, where in the Bible do we find the topic of grudges and forgiveness? Well, we should look at that. We should study those scriptures. I want to begin over here with that in Matthew 22, Matthew 22 with the words of Christ uh, over here beginning in verse 34 because he talks about the great commandment. What's the great commandment? He was asked that. What's the great commandment in the law? And, Master, which is the great commandment? 
uh, in the law. Verse 30, And Jesus said unto them, of course, Jesus being as uh, wise in every, all of his answers, responded this way. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I know we've said this over the years, you know, the first great commandment would be how, how we respond to God in the first four commandments, and then, you know, love your neighbors yourself, how we treat each other in the last six. That would be true. Uh, but there are many other scriptures, too, of how we're to treat, you know, statutes and judgments. Read Leviticus. All, uh, a lot of different commands of how we are to treat one another. But it's interesting here when Jesus is, is uh, quoting here, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that that goes back to, turn with me if you would, back to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19, and we want to read verse 18 here. Uh, actually, actually, let's uh, just back up a little bit because I want to I want you to get get kind of the uh, uh, you know the the things that are being said in this chapter, kind of get it in perspective, trying to get that uh, mindset. It says, verse 14: You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear the Lord your God. I am the Eternal. So these are instructions of how we are to love one another, how we're to deal with one another. Uh, you know, dropping down to verse 17: You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not hate. See, that would be uh, this bitterness, this anger, this animosity that we would create and have. Uh, you, shall in, in, you shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Verse 18, though, is the one I wanted to focus on. It says, You shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the eternal. That is where we begin to see this subject being discussed, coming from Leviticus. And so we, re we realize and we remember another verse in the New Testament. I won't turn there, but I'll refer you to it. John uh, chapter 13, verse 34 through 35, which, which says, Jesus said, A new commandment that I give you, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And how important, important that is, that we love one another. And if we have grudges, if we have animosity, what kind of block does that put up to the proper kind of love that we are to have for one another? So let's look at some of the other scriptures that Jesus talks about uh, when it talks about holding a grudge or grudges. Turn with me over here to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And we want to focus here on verse 25 and 26, where he says this, verse 25, this is Mark 11, When you stand praying, and it was certainly a custom to stand and pray, uh, we do that at church, don't we? Uh, beginning, in, beginning of services and closing of services, we stand and we pray. Nothing wrong with that, that is a, that is a good way to do it. Nothing wrong with us, with us praying on our knees, that's important as well. But it says here, when you stand praying, and of course the emphasis here is that we, pray, that we pray. What does he say though? When you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any. That ought to make us stop right now as we're approaching Passover at this directive. When we're praying, we should stop and forgive if we have any, anything against anyone. In other words, we should go clear it up, take care of it. That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So is this a conditional situation? Yes, it is. This is conditional. Let's continue. Uh, ver again, verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Very, very uh, powerful. That's a very powerful thought. And we find it sometimes difficult to forgive. We, I don't know if it's the forgiveness part of it that's difficult or if it's 
the fact that we need to go talk to somebody and we may have to uh, endure, you know, stern face or re, re, you know, words that are not pleasing to us. But if we would go to those with whom we have something against in a humble uh, attitude asking for forgiveness, then that would be the best. No matter what the response might be, that is what we are told that we should do. Over here in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, we were there a bit ago, but this is chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. We read these words here, and I want to read verses 22 through uh, 25, and then the first three verses of chapter 2. Let's just get this in context. Here uh, in verse 22, it says, Seeing then, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. It's very important. A pure heart with a pure heart. What does that mean? Can we love somebody with a pure heart if we're holding a grudge, if we haven't forgiven them, if we have hate, if we have animosity? Can we have that pure heart that we're supposed to have? <clears throat> Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof falls away, or fades away. But the word of the eternal endureth forever. And this is the word by, which, by the gospel which is preached unto you. Continuing here then in chapter 2. Wherefore, or therefore, you know, it's like emphatically. Conclusion. Here is the... Here is the point. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere uh, milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be that you have tasted that the eternal is gracious. So that is a, that's a great directive, that we lay aside all malice. Uh, any, of the, any of the hatred and animosity that might keep us from taking the Passover in a, in, a, in a proper way, that might keep us from having that pure heart of love, love out of a pure heart for one another. Very, very important. Matthew 5 says this, uh, you know, about the subject. Matthew 5, and I'm sure we've, we remember this one. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard this scripture read. But I think it's important that we read this at this particular time as we're talking about this subject. Uh, it says, verse 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has ought against you. So, oh, this is the other side of the coin. You know, if we have anything against anybody, we ought to go take care of it. But what if somebody has ought against us? What if we know somebody has something against us? What if we know that we are guilty of something? Have we cleared it up? Have we taken care of it? Have we asked for forgiveness? Have we gone and taken care of that? It, it says, if you, you know, remember that you have ought against, uh, your brother has ought against you, verse 24, leave there your gift before the altar and go and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I don't know if we realize how valuable and how important and how necessary it is that we reconcile. That we reconcile with God and that we reconcile with one another and that we love each other with a pure heart fervently because by this shall all men know that we are his disciples and that we clear up any of these difficulties and these circumstances that would keep us from, you know, from doing that very, that very thing. Um, so we sometimes carry a grudge. Hey, uh, I've done it, haven't you? And even though Scripture tells us in Matthew 11, verse 6, Blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. Wouldn't it be great if we were so thick-skinned and tough that we didn't get offended? But alas, unfortunately, we do. We have that capacity, and sometimes we offend one another. Sometimes, uh, you know, and then, some, and then because of that, then we cause others to, to carry that grudge, or we ourselves may carry a grudge. And we find, sometimes find ourselves holding a grudge and don't deal with it as quickly as we should, because I believe that we should deal with our grudges or animosities now, 
quickly and forgive. And it, because if, we're not, if we don't, if we're not careful, it could develop into a festering wound. You know what the scripture calls it? A root of bitterness. And we could develop a bitterness against somebody, even against God, because we would blame him or blame somebody else for a circumstance that may have happened. And it will leave us, if we, if we don't forgive, it will leave us unhappy and unhealed. And remember, His stripes are for our healing, and that would be spiritual as well as physical. And we need to be healed. We need all things healed, physically and spiritually. So, uh, and it, unfortunately, these circumstances sometimes leave scars and painful uh, memories of what a group or what someone did to us. Uh, it usually starts out as a real problem, but if we're not careful, it can become bigger and bigger and bigger and more painful if we just don't take care of it and solve that now. Forgive one another. So what is forgiveness? Let's look at that. What is it? What is forgiveness? Well, we were reading there, you know, Mark eleven twenty five says, when you stand praying, forgive. And forgiveness means to send away. Um, I would remind us of uh, the children of Israel standing before the Holy of Holies when Aaron, you know, laid, you know, confessed the sins of the people on the goat and it was sent away. That is what we do. And God forgave them. That removed the sin from the congregation. That is what we're supposed to do for one another. We are to forgive and send it away and get rid of it. Synonyms would be that we lay it aside, that we would leave it, uh, omit it, that we would put it away, that we would yield, we would give it up. We wouldn't think, it, we wouldn't think about it anymore. Uh, in other words, when we forgive someone, we are no longer personally holding a grudge against them, whether it be a personal offense or words or just whatever has happened. Because forgiveness is letting go. Forgiveness is letting go, sending it away, whatever it be, that we let it go, that we forgive, and that we get rid of that, whether it's intentional or whether it's unintentional. When we forgive someone, it means that we no longer hold on to what that person has done or said to us. We no longer hold on to it. We're sending it away. We're getting rid of it. When it comes to the offense, the offense, whatever it would be, that we, it's like letting it go, letting it be led away. And we see that, how does that get done? How do we do that? It gets done through prayer. It gets done through conversation with God. We, in this process of forgiveness and get, getting rid of grudges, uh, I'm just saying we will not be able to do that without God's involvement. We need Him to be involved with us. And we want him to be involved with us. And we see that it is done through that prayer and through that conversation with God. But you know what? There are, uh, there are some things that forgiveness is not. And I think it's important that we recognize this. There are several points that I believe you know, that to help us understand what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not denial. You see, we're not talking about trying to pretend that something didn't happen. Because pretending that something didn't happen is not forgiveness. That is not what forgiveness is. Uh, something, when we forgive somebody, it is because they have done something. So, we don't want to deny it. We don't deny it. We can't do that. And forgiveness is not simply letting something go so long that we forget about it and forget that it happened. Is that forgiveness? Nope. That's just forgive. That's just, you know, thinking that time heals all things. You know, we've heard that. Time heals all things. No, forgiveness heals all things. Sometimes we can forget, uh, you know, and mask it, but we really haven't done the proper steps if we just let it go so long that we forget about it. Uh, time can help, obviously, but time and forgiveness are not the same concept, are they? We have to remember that. Here's another thing forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not uh, simply excusing another person's sinful behavior. It's just not. That is not forgiveness. It, we don't excuse what people do. 
It doesn't mean we retaliate. We're going to read a scripture on that here in just a minute of why we don't do that. Uh, we just can't blame what uh, some other person did to us because they were, drink, let's say, drinking heavily. So does drunkenness excuse behavior and words and things like that? No, it doesn't. Um, a bad temper, do we excuse that? No. Can we forgive? Yes. Uh, drunkenness, do we forgive that if they have do something to abuse us? Do we forgive that? Yes, we, forgive, we, we do forgive them of that. Do we excuse it? Absolutely not. We don't. So we have to remember that. We just can't let things slide. When it comes to solving our differences and our uh, grudges and uh, healing, our, uh, having the healing process that we need with one another and with our father and our elder brother, then we have to face these situations and we have to learn to forgive like they do. And we're going to read those verses. Here's another thing forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not tolerance. Certainly there are many irritating little situations that we may f just need to tolerate or ignore with each other. You know, husbands and wives, we may have our idiosyncrasies. Here at church, you know, we all have our little idi idiosyncrasies. And we learn to, to deal with that. Uh, that's, that's okay. That's not, not a problem. But guess what? Not everything should be tolerated. Not everything should be tolerated. Abusive language should not be tolerated. Uh, one, of the, one of the hindrances, uh, Ephesians tells us men, that one of the hindrances uh, that we would have to our prayers if we abuse our wives. With, and that would be verbally, that would be emotionally, that would be mentally, that would be physically. That is, that is, it's horrible. It's horrible. And that would hinder our prayers. That should not be tolerated. We cannot tolerate that. Even though we have the ability to let something go, and, you know, sometimes we must, guess what? Just because we let it go, just because we let it and we forgive, does not mean that they won't have to answer to God for what they've done. We, all, we should always remember that. And just remember, you know, if someone says something to us or does something to us that's horrible, we don't, we, our job, forgive. God's job is judge them. He will have to do that. They will have to answer. We will all have to answer what, for what we've said and what we've done and how we've dealt with one another. So just remember that. Um, um, I may be able to forgive someone for putting a dent in my car, right? Yeah, I can do that. I've put a couple of dents in cars too, haven't you? Uh, the other person will still have to, you know, uh, let me forgive me if I run into their car. Uh, but you know who isn't going to forgive me? The insurance company, right? So, you know, even though we do forgive, just remember there is accountability and that God is the righteous judge and we will, be, we will all have to be held accountable for what we've done. And if I dent somebody's car, then I'm held accountable by the insurance company and I have to pay for that. And, you know, God is the fair judge, and I'm really, really, really thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> I, I may be able, also be able to forgive someone for breaking into my house, but that doesn't mean that they should, uh, you know, escape a term in prison because they've done that. You know, there is just punishment for those kind of things, and we can forgive them for breaking in. It uh, doesn't mean that, uh, you know, they might not have to go to prison. I just don't have to stand there with a grudge and animosity towards them for what they've done. We have a hard time of just letting go and forgiving. Um, also, and I think this is maybe one of the most important uh, things that forgiveness is not, uh, my letting go of a grudge or, uh, you know, your letting go of a grudge when we, when we do that does not always mean that we have to reestablish a relationship with those that have offended us, okay? It is, it is mandatory, I believe, that we forgive. It doesn't mean we have to establish a relationship. Look, if my child or my grandchild is abused at daycare uh, <clears throat> by somebody, uh, when I release my hatred and I have to do that and I forgive, it doesn't mean that I have to send them back to that 
daycare center, does it? Doesn't mean that we have to establish. Af excuse me. After all, forgiveness is not conditional upon actually rest restoring a relationship. It's wonderful if it happens, but there are situations and times when we should not restore a relationship and when we should avoid a person. Uh, if you want to know when and how that is, then you know that probably is an individual, you know, uh, circumstance, case by case. Just remember, when we are forgiving, we are, we are fulfilling what is said over here in Psalms 103. Just remember that our Heavenly Father and our elder brother are perfect in their forgiveness. Notice this, this is Psalms 103. Uh, beginning here in verse 8, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Notice that's the Lord. You know, put your name there. You know, uh, when is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He, when will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. You know, we, we have to, we read these things and apply it to ourselves, don't we, as we, as we read these things. But then, reference to, to our Father, it says, He has not dealt with us after our sins. That humbles me and makes me realize that He has been merciful to me. I need to be merciful to others. Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Because what do we deserve? Well, we, we deserve death. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. God forgives. So far as the east is from the west, He doesn't remember them. Whew. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what if I'm not that way? What if I won't forgive? What if I won't do that? So, forgiving a grudge means that we have to turn it over to God. We have to ask His help. We tell God that we no longer want to hold on to that baby, <laughs> that grudge, that anger. We tell God that we no longer want to harbor any resentment in our heart because we want to be healed completely from that. We no longer uh, want to be filled with bitterness and enmity and hatred and spite. We no longer want to carry deep-seated feelings of resentment. We no longer want to be grouchy in our hearts towards any person. We want to get those things resolved and taken care of. Uh, you know, we no longer want to wish them a long and miserable life. You know, we have a tendency to do that. And we want to just, you know, dismiss them and kiss them off and say bye-bye forever. And we can't do that. And again, we're not excusing a behavior if it's sinful. We're just turning it over to God. And we're asking for His help. And we're asking to help us to learn to forgive and to remove those grudges and animosities and things that have been done, sinful, whether sinful or not, and remove them as far as the east is from the west, and we get rid of those things, and that we don't carry those things. And, and because we recognize, I forgive you, and say, I forgive you, and we also recognize, and we probably should even pray that God have mercy on them, because just because we let them off the hook doesn't mean that God will let them off the hook. And so... Maybe we should be praying for them and saying, God, please be merciful. They need your mercy and they didn't do it on purpose. And if they did, Father, forgive them anyway. Don't hold it to their account. Romans 12. Uh, this is, I think, monumental to us in the concept of forgiveness. Romans chapter 12. And I want to read a couple of verses here, verses eight, 18 to 19. Romans 12. It says, verse 18... If it be possible, which tells me, excuse me just a minute, if it be possible, which tells me maybe it isn't always possible, but if it be possible, it would be nice if it was possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably, peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Oh, we are good at that. I am good at that. I want to avenge. I want to immediately rise up, you know, with the knuckle savage mentality. But I can't because of what it says here. But rather, give place unto the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, 
I will replay, I will repay, says the Lord. And I recognize that if I rise up in retaliation, I'm getting satisfaction for who? For me. Doesn't mean it's right. There is only one just judge, and it's God. We turn it over to Him, and then we pray that He have mercy on those that have treated us incorrectly. And, you know, but trouble is, we, we want to we want to pay. We want to do those paybacks. You know the old saying. You ever heard the saying, "Paybacks are, you know, paybacks." But we read all and all important words in the book of Colossians. Very important words over here in Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three, because we have to learn to forgive one another. Colossians three here in verse twelve says, "Put on." So here are our characteristics as the children of God as Christians, that we are to have. When it means put on, it's like putting on clothes that we wear them, but not just as an outward, that we put them in our hearts, that we are this way. As the elect of God, holy, that we put on, be, uh, excuse me, that we put on holy and beloved bowels of mercies. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. That we're able to, you know, suffer a lot of things, long-suffering, and deal with a lot of things, and forgive a lot of things, as we'll keep reading. Forbearing one another. We have to put up with the differences of personalities and the things we do, and even if, you know, if we see somebody doing something wrong, instead of jumping on them, let's see if we can help, help them with understanding. It's our approach, our approach. And this is the approach that God tells us we are to have, forbearing one another and forgiving one another <clears throat> and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any as Christ forgave you so also do you oh wow wow so every time we're not forgiving that should slap us in the face because Christ has forgiven us we should be thinking oh what am I doing I can't be like this. I can't be this way. And so the Bible tells us, reach out and take that first step and, and seek forgiveness um, because that is what God has done for us. He has done that. He has forgiven us while we were yet sinners. Notice this, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, here in verse 8, we read this. Uh, I would read uh, maybe some of the other, uh, I'm, I'm going to recommend that you read this whole chapter, but it's very, very valuable because of the words that are said. But verse 8 says, but God commends his love towards us. In other words, God shows his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, would we die for somebody that has wronged us? We typically know we want to get retaliation. We don't want to die for them. But while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. That is monumental. That is a huge, huge thought process. So think about the story of Peter. And we all know that Peter denied Christ. How many times? How many times? Three. Three times. You know, you can read uh, Mark's account. You can read John's account. And then we read, you know, and he, he even got so vehement he was cussing. I don't know that guy. One of Christ's disciples denying him vehemently. And then Matthew, I think it's 27, it's kind of at the end of the chapter, might be verse 58, somewhere in there, when the cock, when that rooster crowed, the light bulb went on, what he had done, and it says he went out and he wept bitterly. I would like to have been around for the first conversation that Christ had with Peter after that, after his resurrection. Uh, Peter, you know, Peter denied him. Christ, you know, they, they, the first meeting. Do you think Christ went, you denied me. You denied me three times. Get out of here. Was that Christ's attitude? Actually, his attitude was just the opposite. He said, P 
Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Read that in John chapter 21. Three times. I want, he repeated it three times. I wonder why. It would be three times. But he said, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then he didn't say, well, how come you denied me then? No. What did he say? He said, feed my sheep. Take care of my people. And he, uh, you know, forgave him. That is the example. I want to tell you a story. This is a, a, a very personal one for me. Uh, it is a story about my mother and something that happened to her that I didn't know about, didn't find out about until, uh, you know, long after her death. And she died in 1991, so uh, I... I, I found out subsequently, and from my sister, uh, because my mom told my sister, something that happened to my mother uh, that um, we never knew about. And so I want to relate this story, because the reason I relate it is that uh, I believe my mother was a merciful, forgiving person, and our lives never was a reflection or we never saw from her a reflection or a, a part of her that would have um, been damaged from things that had happened to her in the past. So she had dealt with it and she had forgiven because, you know, my brother and my sister and myself, we, we had a great upbringing, we had great parents. But let me tell you the story. So my mother... Uh, <coughs> was raped by one of her cousins, which is horrible in itself, you know, that a cousin would do that to another cousin. But she was, she was raised, raped and it was forcible. And not only that, but subsequently she found out that she was pregnant because of this. So here's my mom, raped, and now she's pregnant. Uh, for those of you that have experienced anything like that out there, I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry that that happened. Uh, this is how uh, evilness is in the world, and I'm sorry about that. We will have a world to come where that we won't allow that. So <clears throat> the family finds out that mom is pregnant, and what do they do? Well, this is in the 40s, 1940s, and there was um, a lot less tolerance. They, there was a lot less mercy then than there is now, I think, for those kind of situations. There was no help. And in fact, they accused her of not fighting hard enough. You didn't, it's your fault. You let him do it. Uh, you, you didn't resist. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. And their reaction, frankly, was embarrassment. Their reaction was embarrassment and uh, therefore, where was the help that should have gone out to take care of my mom? So there wasn't any of that and she had to leave and she left and she moved down to, uh, my mom grew up in uh, North Carolina, Washington, North Carolina, which is along the coast and so with all of this and the resentment of family and the embarrassment to family, she left. She, she left and she went down to Norfolk, Virginia. And there, uh, you know, for, for the period of time, uh, the baby came, you know, carried the baby uh, through the term. And the baby was born and you know, she had a baby. And she's having to work as well uh, and, and make a living with all of this. So here's my mom dealing with rape. Uh, resentment, uh, family who doesn't want to help. Uh, she is the child of a baby where the father is not there and she's had to move and she's dealing with all these circumstances. My mom. And <clears throat> subsequently the baby died. And so now my mom has, on top of all of that, she's carried this baby for nine months and, you know, now it dies. So the good, I guess the bright side of that is that 
during those days, my dad, uh, coming in out of the Navy, in fact, uh, the war was ending, and they came back in and they, debar uh, they came in for a few days into Norfolk on the way back to him being decommissioned out in uh, San Pedro, uh, California, or San Diego, I should say, because uh, uh, the, the family was from San Diego or from California, I should say. Um, so he stops there and he happens to enter the restaurant where my mom is working. And they have a spark and Five days later, not saying that this is the way it should always be in a relationship, in a courtship, uh, they were engaged and she left there, he gave her money and she ended up out in California and they got married and my dad protected her. And my dad protected her and loved her not only during that time but protected her and, and helped her and made her safe from all of that stuff that went on in the past and I appreciate my dad for that. And, you know, thank him for that. I, you know, I, I always wanted, when I found this out, it's like, why didn't she tell us? I wanted to help her and comfort her. But, frankly, more than that, what I wanted to do was I wanted to jump on a plane and go to North Carolina. But I found out that the other cousins had already done that and beat him within, an, like, an inch of his life. And I didn't need to have that vengeance as mine. And guess what? He'll have to answer for what he did to my mom. And, you know, it's just a, a sad, sad situation. And there are passages that I think we should look at uh, because I believe my mother forgave. There was no lessening of her life or PTSD or any of that. I'm sure she, obviously, she carried the memories. But I believe she forgave because we didn't feel any of that animosity or any of that hatred. It was not there all of my life, uh, all, until, you know, all of her life, too, from that time on. I believe she forgave. And I believe, uh, you know, there are several scriptures that we should look at here as we begin to wrap this up to give us, to give us a clue of how important the kind of forgiveness is that we are required to do, the kind of forgiveness that we need to be practicing towards one another. And by the way, the kind of, pra the kind of forgiveness that Jesus Christ exercised and the kind of forgiveness that the Father exercises as well. Over here, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, and you know, this is the one I think we're familiar with, Matthew chapter 6, when we're talking about you know, the, uh, the, the kind of prayers, the model prayer that we're supposed to have. I just want to read a couple of verses out of here that will maybe highlight a little bit more of what we read in Mark 11. But it says in, in verse... Uh, uh, verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the, power, the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, apparently Jesus felt that he needed to explain that a little bit more because then he goes to the next verse and says, For if you forgive men their trespasses your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's what Jesus said. But, verse, notice this, verse 15, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. I don't know about you, that makes this topic and this subject and forgiveness very urgent and very, very important. Um, and then Matthew 18 tells us how we are to do that. You know, how do we do that? It says, you know, if you go to offer your, you know, your altar, your gift at the altar, uh, then you go talk to him, you and him alone, and you work it out. I highly recommend that if we have any of these grudges or any of these uh, situations that are causing us ill will, that we take care of that and we go work it out between them. Uh, our different offenses and sins are to be worked out between those we have offended or those who have offended us, whether we are the offended or the offender, work it out. Get rid of it. Take care of it. And uh, turn with me there to Matthew chapter 18 because, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I'll forgive him one time. That's all. Yeah, I'll let him slide this time. Well, first of all, if we're in that kind of attitude, we, we, we really haven't done what Scripture says, have we? Because we haven't had our heart 
We haven't uh, taken on the characteristics of the Father, which is to remove it as far as the east is from the west. We forget about it. But notice this. Peter, verse 21, came to him, to Jesus, after he had talked about you know, this. And he said, uh, How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And he said, and, you know, till seven times? You know, that, <laughs> I think Peter thought he was being generous. So I forgive him seven times? What did Christ answer? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. That just means forever. I mean, that was the, the point. We always forgive. And, and, and when would we not forgive? When would we put a limit on? Well, if they do this to me one more time, I'm not going to forgive them. Can't do that. That isn't what Scripture says. And if we've injured others, we need to go reconcile very quickly. We should not wait. Over here in Matthew, this is a, when we're thinking about forgiveness and we're thinking about mending the differences that we might have and the emulations and the grudges that we might uh, have with one another, notice what this says here in verse 43 of, of Matthew chapter 5. It says, You have heard that it has been said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now again, we're here in the, the uh, most powerful section uh, probably of the Bible, the, the framework of the Sermon on the Mount that kind of frames our Christian walk, okay? And so we're reading here, and this says, you know, uh, if you're, uh, verse, uh, love your, excuse me, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But what does he say? Verse 44, he says, but, what, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. What? Love your enemies? Bless them that curse you? Do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you? What? Really? Hmm. Wow. That, the answer is yes. Yes, we, we are to do those things. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Because that's what they do. They forgave. They forgive. They move they forget those things, and they move forward. For he makes his, makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, <laughs> what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same. If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do the same. But be you therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And he perfectly forgives. And we are to follow that example. And let's be reminded just of a couple of verses here. John chapter 3. Just reminded of how much forgiveness and how much love the Father and our elder brother and our Savior, the Son of God, have for us. In John chapter 3, we know uh, verse 16 is read, you know, we see it up there on, uh, you know, many sporting events. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then it's kind of done cheaply. But let's read this. For beginning here, verse 13, it says, No man is ascended up to heaven, but he which came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. If anybody tells you they've gone to heaven or that their uncle or their aunt or their brother or their sister, just don't, don't be mean to them, but just say, well, if that's the case, then how do you explain verse 13? You know, put it back on them with a question. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. This was uh, an inst- you know, a prophecy, a foretelling of what was to come that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God, this is how much God loves us. This is how much God loves the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son, notice this, into the world to condemn the world. No, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That was the love that the Father and the Son have for us. 
And, you know, notice also what's said here in Romans chapter 5, where we were earlier. Let's notice this. We read it, but I want to read it again, verse 8. But God commends His love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is how much they love us. That is how much they care for us. And so I ask, how can we do less? If they're willing to forgive, why aren't we? Why can't we? And each of us will have to deal with this subject and, you know, the situations and circumstances we have. The greatest example of forgiveness to me can be found over here in the book of Luke, chapter 23, as we wind this up. Luke, chapter 23. In verse, I want to read verse 34. And remember, this is, uh, Christ is on the cross. He's being crucified. And, you know, he's got, you know, one on his right and one on his left. Excuse me. <clears throat> it says, verse 33, And when, when they came to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on his right hand and one on the left. And they then said Jesus, talking about those that were crucifying him and killing him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he wasn't guilty. None of this should have happened. And yet, he was still willing to say, forgive them. I believe we should be able to do that. Can we do any less than our Lord? I recently read a great statement about forgiveness. I really hope that we will adopt this statement, that we will make it a part of our lives, that we will make it a part of um, our thought process whenever we have difficulties with others and there are offenses and forgiveness is required and we may feel have that animosity and grudginess. The story is revolved around an incident that happened to Clara Barton, who Clara Barton was the founder of the uh, American Red Cross. So apparently, someone tried to get her to remember some terrible thing that someone had done to her a number of years earlier. And they were surprised that she did not remember what had happened. And they kept pressing her about this issue. Don't you remember this? Don't you remember that? This person, until finally she said this. A great slogan, one we need to adopt. No, I distinctly remember forgetting it. I love that. It wasn't by accident that she forgot. It wasn't that she was ignoring the offense that had happened. It wasn't that she was pretending it didn't happen. Nope. She made it a concerted effort to let go of what was done. And I pray that each of us will be able to do that as well. She chose to forgive, and so should we. And so as we come upon these days of unleavened bread, the Passover, remembering what Christ has done for us, that he died for us, I hope we will work out any differences, any uh, angers, any, uh, any animosities, any, anything we have against anybody that we resolve it and that we do it like Clara Barton and we say, I distinctly remember forgetting that. I remember, I don't remember it anymore. So, if we are holding something against someone, if we are holding a grudge or a resentment, I hope we will think about what we've read today. I hope we will think about the examples of Christ, examples of the Father, the example that Christ said, when you stand praying, forgive and that we will do just that, that we will forgive. And as we approach these days, let's not let anything come in the way of our prayers with God, because this could hinder it. Because if we don't forgive, then we won't be forgiven. In the model prayer, you know, this could hinder our prayers. Let's make sure that that doesn't happen. Let's make sure that our holding of grudges and our unwillingness to forgive one another goes away. And that not one of those two things would keep us from the importance and the beauty of the Passover and the days ahead. 
So let's keep our focus here. Let's forgive one another. And most of all, let's love one another uh, as we come into the Passover season.